know it looks to me like we're going to have another amazing interview today. What do you think? I do too, and I don't know that I have a favorite because everyone we've interviewed over the last year and a half has been so interesting and had a lot of information to share with us. Lucky for us, what makes our guests so special is their openness and their willingness to share different aspects of their personal lives. Yeah, one thing for sure, we all learn from each other. Hi, everyone. Hope you've been having a wonderfully creative week. I'm Ron Jones, and we celebrate what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice so you can learn and be motivated from their life's experiences. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to Thought Road Podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we focus on sharing with everyone how they can think, be, and live more creatively. Okay, Angie, how about telling us who our guest is today? Okay, our guest today is Shara Lewis Campbell, and she's a writer, publisher, and co-founder of Beauty and the Beast Publishing. We're going to chat with her about her unique approach to finding authors to publish. Shara's written numerous books herself. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's quite a talent. So, quote time, what Mm -hmm. do you have for us today? Okay, well, here is our quote for today's episode. And here it is. The role of the writer is not to say what we all can say, but what we are all unable to say. And that is by Anais Nin. Anais Nin. She was a diarist, essayist, novelist, and a writer of short stories. And I might add a very colorful person. Right. She really was. And um, But now I think it's time for our interview with Shara Lewis Campbell. And she's quite the writer herself. Yes, she is. Hi, Shara. Welcome to the Thought Road Podcast. You know, we're really excited to learn about your life in writing and publishing. I'm excited about this. Yes, me too. Hi, Shara. You have such an interesting life and story, and I'm sure we will all be inspired and motivated by your thoughts and ideas. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here with you both today. And uh, thank you very much for having me. And we hear the little one in the background. Yes. And don't worry about him. We love children. Absolutely. The Thought Road Podcast oh, loves kids. Yeah. <laughs> you might change your mind at the end of the session. <laughs> <laughs> this little uh, one. It's very it, rambunctious. Yeah, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Before we start the interview, Shar, we always ask the guests, what did they have for breakfast? So what did you have? It's a really good question. Just gone seven o'clock here in the evening. So mm-hmm. uh, that was quite the, a long time ago now. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but <laughs> thinking about it, I would have um, definitely have had um, started my day with a peppermint tea and with a dash of honey. And um, owing to being at an event last night and not sort of getting into a very late this morning, I wouldn't have had anything first thing. So I would have had left it to the little bit later mm-hmm. uh, to have had something sort of quite late in the, in the, the morning. And for what I remember having, I had, um, I treated myself to a mango and I, I also had like a, a croissant as well to go with it. And that was me. That's a good <laughs> That sounds lovely. Good enzymes. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and delicious. Yes. And yeah. delicious. Yeah. So delicious. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and it was homemade as well, my oh. um, croissant. Oh, um, really? how lucky you event. are. <laughs> yeah. What a lucky girl. Yeah. Those are always good. Spoiling myself. <laughs> so, Shara, why don't you share with us where you're originally from and where you grew up? Yeah, sure. So I'm actually, I was born in a very small place contained in one of the largest uh, cities, if not the largest city, called Birmingham in the the UK, in the United Kingdom here. And um, it's a small place called Small Heath, and they all have an accent which I don't have because um, I don't particularly like it, if I'm very honest with you. But my parents tell me when I was about just less than three months, we moved to London, and that's where my accent comes from, and that's where I was raised. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, it's a lovely accent. Yes, very pretty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. <laughs> so when you were growing up, do you have a favorite childhood memory from there, from that time? Um, 
Not really, because it, 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 in, in a way, I can't think of a particular instance like offhand at the moment, probably because it just seems so long ago, if I'm <laughs> honest. Um, I do think of one. But um, from what I can recall, um, and it was like one I had most recently as well when um, I was asked a, a similar question, I remember quite vividly most weekends, if not every weekend, my mum treated me to a really large bar of uh, Toblerone, which is um, it's quite weighty, <laughs> probably about 25 grams. And it, yeah, uh, for a young child who would have been, I would have barely had teeth, you know. <laughs> um, I remember like being graced with this sort of, sort of like, it's a hard nougat sort of um, almond chocolatey thing. Oh, yes, in, um, we are familiar sort of with that. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah, and I love it. I still do it today. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely yeah. scrumptious. I and they agree. have uh, it great, is, isn't it? great packaging. Oh, I know. So pretty. Yes, yes. But I would have one of those gold bars. I mean, they come in white bars now and so on, but I remember being treated to sort of like the beige sort of gold packaging of it. And then the inside would have like the, the wrapper on it, the foil wrapper and and so on, and the, like the mounds of <laughs> triangles that I would just try to stuff, <laughs> oh, yes. you know, and eat and devour as quickly as possible. <laughs> it definitely had an elegance. I agree. Toblerone, when you get it, you feel like you're getting something yeah. really elegant, and especially when something you're a kid up, and grown it? up, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And even when you, I struggle with it today, if I do <laughs> or try to manage a, a piece of uh, the triangle within, because um, it's quite a mound. I don't know how I managed it then. I don't know whose idea it was. Um, I, mean, I wouldn't give that to my grandson at that age. Okay, now. well, now, now that you've got us salivating for chocolate, I, know, I right? think we need to move into your <laughs> career. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. So let's fast forward to today. And yeah. my question is, when did you first discover you wanted to, a career in writing and publishing? Okay. Well, funny enough, it takes me back to my childhood again. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's probably the only thing I can ever recall wanting to do for as, as long as I was able to read, you know, as, as going as far back as that. Not so much being a publisher, um, which is what I do today, and which I absolutely love, mm -hmm. um, but more so about wanting to be you know, an author, because I was always reading and just loved it. So anything to do with that, I, I just always wanted to write my own books as far as I could remember. Well, that's definitely creative. And, you know, and when you when you want to express yourself in the written word, I mean, there's nothing better, nothing better. Yeah. So, Shara, why, yes. don't, you, why don't you tell us about the first book that you wrote? What was it about? And did you self-publish that book? Yeah. So my first book, my first uh, self-published book um, was called McGowan's Beach. And it's actually a beach romance with a bit of an unexpected twist at the end. It's actually the first book is actually part of a trilogy. And it's based on a true story and carries themes regarding prejudice and racism and how the main character was able to overcome those adversities. So it is very much um, uh, was the first self-published publication that I had uh, done yeah that sounds wonderful. <laughs> seems like a long time like, ago as well now <laughs> like it sounds like a very kind of involved story how wonderful was the process yeah. of you self-publishing did you find that during the time that you did it, I mean more and more authors now do self-publish there mm -hmm. seems to be a lot of advantages to doing that and there's also yeah. huge advantages of working ah. with boutique publishers which I guess that's how I would yeah. refer to you but was that a real challenge getting that book published? Not really. I think the, the for me, I I felt that it was more of a challenge actually writing um, the story, you know, and um, having all the content down, etc. I found that that part of it more challenging the first go around. Mm -hmm. um, but the publishing part of it, I found, was um, quite easy and probably really straightforward. I was so keen to. To get it published once it had been written, I found that part of the process the first time around quite easy and, uh, yeah, and, and very straightforward. Knowing what I know now, all these years later, I can, I can tell you probably I would go back and strip it all and do it all over again, but I just don't have the time, you know, at the moment. Sure. But um, it's something that I have thought about. But, um, yeah, I was just happy to just get it out there, to be honest. And um, <laughs> however it looks and whatever is uh, maybe could be tweaked here and there, Mm -hmm. tweet here and there I don't think uh, detracts from the story according to the feedback that I get 
And that book is available where? It's available on um, my website, which is uh, beautyandthebeastpublishing.net. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's also uh, available as well on Amazon and on Amazon Kindle. Oh, okay, okay great. Okay, so everywhere, basically. Everywhere. Yeah. That's yes, very good. everywhere. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you about Beauty and the Beast Publishing, because I know you, yeah. along with your associate, founded Beauty and the Beast Publishing, which is your publishing company. Tell us a yes. little bit about it. Yeah, sure. Well, prior to forming Beauty and the Beast Publishing, I had had a, a small previous uh, company, a publishing company, just prior to that. And that was when I had first published. So, McGoran's Beach and so forth. So, I opened a smaller a uh, very small publishing company, just a one-man band, and um, running that successfully for about a year or so, but it was being revamped. And then thereafter that, I decided um, I had, had been in, somebody had been in contact with me on behalf of my associate business partner, Andrew uh, Foster. And at the time when they contacted me on his behalf, it was that he was uh, very desperate to become a published poet and author Mm -hmm. um, with his own books and was becoming quite uh, frustrated about it. And the main reason for that was because he was incarcerated at the time. So I felt compelled when I heard the story about, you know, how desperate he was to publish and I could resonate and relate a lot to that at the time. So I I felt so, you know, feeling very compelled to do so. I was in the process of revamping my previous publishing company and um, we set to work. And within about two weeks, we had published his first, had had got the first book ready for publishing. Mm -hmm. And we managed to, considering all the obstacles, we were able to do that very seamlessly without a hitch, to be honest, which I was, we were both really surprised about, as well as it could be done, right. you know, considering all the factors. So um, we were most pleased with that outcome. And then um, as there afterwards, once we published and with, um, you know, the success of that publication, mm-hmm. Andrew was very keen to uh, publish again. And I was very keen to do so as well, because, um, you know, not only to sort of uh, support him as an author in his position, I also felt as well that it would be, just felt it was like a bit of a calling, to be honest. And um, mm-hmm. I also felt that Andrew wasn't the only person um, that was uh, experiencing that. And I wanted to continue, but I didn't want to do it. I wanted to make it more fairer um, to both of us, you know, rather it just being a, you know, an advantage for me. And uh, we just discussed opening up a publishing company together. Mm-hmm. And instead of re- revamping the previous company that I had, we decided that we were going to just form this new company, Beauty and the Beast Publishing, which yes. we did in uh, December 2020. So it's a fairly yeah. new company. That's really interesting. Yes. So your partner currently is incarcerated, right? He is. Yeah. He's just uh, currently waiting release. That's incredible that you can you can yeah. do this with someone. And then I feel like it really gives someone really inspiration to go out and do something once they get out that that was probably a passion for him as well. Exactly. You also yeah. you also have a bit of a logistic thing here, too, because yeah, isn't do. he in the United States? That's right. Yes. Um, based in. Um, um, yeah. 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 So, so it is a bit guys, of a logistical problem. Yeah. But we are doing it. We work internationally anyway, yeah. you know. So, yeah, we've, we've published authors um, around the world. So we just can continue with the same process. And we realize that we've got a really good formula and uh, we work extremely well together. And it's been quite successful to date. I mean, um, in terms of aspiring authors, we've managed to publish 66 to date. And 16 of those have been incarcerated or in halfway uh, homes or have since been released you know, from their incarceration at the time when the, we connected with them, as well as other um, aspiring authors from other backgrounds, you know, from other hardships as well. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I hear a little one in the background. He's so cute. I know. He's making so much noise. No, no. So he's he's adorable. I, I wish we could see him. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, uh, Shara, so you published over 60 books in a matter of two years, practically, right? Yeah, over 60. In fact, I'm just thinking about the ones that I've just done in the last week. So that's, uh, I think, believe it's 68 we've done that is quite an endeavor congratulations on that just that alone (laughs) is is tough work yeah 
Yeah. I think so. I think it's good competition uh, for traditional publishers anyway. Yes, it is. <laughs> it very much is. Well, that kind of goes along yeah. with what I was going to ask you or say next. Mm-hmm. We know you've put a tremendous amount of time and effort into publishing your books along with other books. Yes. Uh, describe the type of people that you believe would really enjoy the books that you have written and or published. Who's your audience? I- Who's reading these books that you've written? We publish in most genres, um, barring a few. So I feel that we are open to most sorts of demographics. And we've been quite surprised with the audience that have um, read them. Just yesterday I was at an event and um, uh, quite a few um, young men were interested in reading the books when I was telling them the the stories, you know, of of how, you know, who who had published the books, etc. And a little bit about the background of my company as well. Um, which we're keen to learn. So it seems to me that the the demographic can be quite varied, um, but the ages um, seem to range from anyone in their late teens um, to to people that were in their sixties that were purchasing the books yesterday. So oh, nice. um, you know, it's a, nice. yeah, it's quite quite a, a wide range in demographic, which I'm quite uh, pleased about. And um, yeah, I would say that anyone who comes from a disenfranchised um, background would be very keen and very interested to read our books because they could uh, resonate with the struggle and overcoming adversity, etc. Yeah, that's um, a good point. So, mm, that's a very yeah, good point you I just so. made. How do these people find you as a publisher? Or are you out seeking authors that fit your mission? Yeah, so there's several ways. I mean, um, I think in terms of... In terms of our branding and, and that we're doing so many books at the moment, what's happened is, is that the word is getting out and obviously our awareness and, um, you know, obviously with collaborative working as well also helps as well, um, put us out there. With also like speaking to people like yourself as well that have such a, a large audience mm-hmm. <laughs> um, means that we can reach a, an even greater um, demographic as well, you know, just to make them aware of the services that we, that we provide, etc. And also the fact that um, as well as that, we do lots of uh, events and we are also associated with other uh, uh, writing forums as well um, and other writing industries that we work with. And um, and they also have their own platforms, for instance, and we work, we are global syndicates with another writing platform called 360 Nation. Mm-hmm. And on that platform, they have um, over 2.5 uh, visitors almost daily to the uh, website. So it's one of the largest writing platforms. And we, we are also on there as well with our own profiles as well as we do lots of project work with them as well. So as well with as well as other mm-hmm. uh, partnerships as well. I don't want to discredit anyone, <laughs> you know, or forget about anyone. So and that helps to kind of, uh, you know, keep us out there. And uh, we're consistently working. You are busy. You are a busy lady. Very. Yeah. yeah, we don't, we barely sleep. Honestly, we are that busy and because we work across continents yeah, as and well. When you're international. And you really can't yeah. sleep because yeah. you're trying to catch up yeah, with each we, other. <laughs> Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, as you know, between uh, GMT or British Standard Time and EST, for instance, there's five hours difference. So <laughs> well, we stay open. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, I'm fascinated by the quote that you use from Nadine mm-hmm. Gordermeyer. Right. And this is the quote. The truth isn't always beauty, but the hunger for it is. What meaning does that quote have for you? It's a great quote, by the way. I mean, like Dean Gordimer is uh, someone, um, he is, a, I would say, very much an underrated um, author who is also a Pulitzer uh, Booker Prize winner as well. Mm-hmm. Um, she wrote, she's, uh, she was a South African writer who wrote about the truth as she saw it in terms of segregation and so forth as according to the events that were taking place at the time when she was writing you know she wrote from a place of censorship you know where it wasn't encouraged um for people to write about the truth and uh you know because of her writing she was able to sort of shape apartheid and have a real positive influence on it you know which we're so grateful for because um Mm -hmm. it's been able to change the narrative and just to change the way of of the way that people think, you know, in terms of segregation and racism, prejudice and things, and censorship even. Yes. So for me, just looking at 
even the demographic that I work with and the work that I'm involved with and the humanitarian aspects of our work, as well as the compassionate um, way in which we lead, I feel that it often is the case that the process isn't often beautiful. So I can really resonate. Mm-hmm. And, um, and having experienced some of the things that she speaks about, not to that extent, but having personally experienced a few key issues uh, or topics that she writes about that um, I relate to, mm-hmm. you know, I agree with the statement, you know, that the truth isn't often uh, beautiful, but I, I do feel that the process of finding out the truth can be. That's Very great. much so, quote. yes. A hundred percent. Now, I know um, we were talking about your partner who's incarcerated. Yes. And I yes. know that on your website, you mention this term, social restorative reform. That's Can right. you tell us about that, Shara? Yes. So outside of the business work that we, the business that we have, we are also very staunch supporters of social justice reform. Yes. And um, what we do is that we raise awareness and, and we campaign about that through our nonprofit uh, organization called The Shift. Um, and it's really the only course of avenue that we tend to use to promote. And we would just like to see more of a We would like to see more equality, you know, within the world and just people being treated fairly, you know, irrespective of their background or race or, Mm -hmm. you know, their history or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what we promote and we advocate for. And at the moment, we feel that um, non-profit is based here in the UK, but we are currently going through a process of transition um, where we will be moving it to the States, uh, the United States, because we feel that um, there's more cause and need for it there. So, um, yeah, it's um, really going through an exciting period at the moment where we are going to be really launching it. And, uh, yeah, with a whole new board of directors and a new focus. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to bringing you um, or launching that and, uh, you know, bringing you the details um, as and when they uh, happen. So we're currently going through a phase of transitioning that company and also making doing more promotion Mm -hmm. around social uh, justice reformation. Yeah, and it's just a really exciting time. I think that there needs to be a period of change, and I would like to have a a hand and a say in that. Absolutely, and and you're making a difference, and that's what it's about. Well, change is an issue that the entire world has to deal with. Absolutely. It's not just this country, it's every country. It's everywhere. But I want to ask you, I I want to get back to publishing, and I have a question regarding that. Let's say I have been working on a legacy book, What would you tell me as the most important thing when it comes to conveying my story to readers, seeing how you're a writer and a publisher? (laughs) And no, I'm not writing a legacy. (laughs) But I want to know if I decide to, what do you have to say? Or someone. Or someone. someone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, that's the kind of writing that we are very, very interested in because, I mean, those books sort of stand the test of time you know those are real authentic stories that mean a lot to society and pe- so many people benefit from them when i wrote mcgoran's beach that is also uh, talking about a period of life you know that uh, and transition that i went through um, when i lived in australia you know for four years and um, that is also part of my legacy and i feel that so many people can learn um, from the themes that cu- that arise in, um, that have come out of that book in terms of overcoming adversity. I think it's such an important topic these days, you know, um, and it's not spoken about enough. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just how people can learn as well. And I just think it's so important for people to give their testimonies because it provides legacy. Well, I'm it sure. does. And we all can have different perspectives. I mean, we all have different experiences, life experiences. Exactly. And we have different perspectives on life and our own interpretations. Some of them are very personal and very accurate and others may yes. not always be accurate, but it was relevant to the time that we were living and thinking and being. So okay. I think you covered it really well there. Absolutely. So oh, thank you. Get out my pencil and paper and yeah, I'll start busy. my legacy <laughs> get book. Busy, I definitely yeah. recommend it. <laughs> Boy, that'll be all over the place. Boy, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, most of the stories that um, or that we books that we published, especially people from the groups, the demographic that I've mentioned, they often do tell their stories, whether it just be a part of their stories or you know their entire mm. you know story. I, we we wrote we published sorry a a book for a client once, and um, his story um, had been written over a period of forty years before we published it. Mm. My goodness. You know, yeah, it was, um, and it was written, it was about his transition um, with spirituality. And uh, we published that book for him. It was just such an amazing experience for us to be able to do that, you know. That, well, that's so valuable to everyone, especially on the spiritual yeah. level where you can, you know, perhaps evolve or hearing and, and reading other people's perspectives on that really it makes a huge difference. And it, it does, does. It does take a life of experiences. You know, somebody's spirituality at 18 years old is going to be yes. quite a bit different when they turn 60 yeah. or 70. I agree. And the older you get, you look at your spirituality changes. Well, so you evolve. You, thank you. You, you do evolve. evolve. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and it's also very interesting to hear what somebody, what their thoughts and ideas are when they're a teen. And yeah. then what yes. they think when they're, having midlife crises <laughs> and then yes. what they may think yes. about when they become more mature. I mean, the interesting thing about age and time is that for the most of us, it kind of seems to mellow us out a little bit and we don't yes. sweat stuff so bad. Yeah. You know, we yes. don't take ourselves so seriously and others so seriously. <laughs> and we get to the point where, you know, okay, I've got that behind me. Thank goodness. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I, I think I think that I suspect also some of the people that you publish, they're evolving, and maybe yes. the book that you publish that they have written today could be a heck of a lot different five years from now or ten years from now. Because, and I have to go back to the fact that if some of these authors are incarcerated, there's a reason why they were incarcerated, yes. but they're evolving, yes. and it's kind yeah, of cool. Learning, it's, learning. It's, yeah, but I think. And Shari, you would probably know more about this than me, but I think the process of just writing is like people when they journal. It's very revealing yes. and you go through a lot of self discovery mm -hmm. and you're allowing, yeah. you're allowing these people the opportunity to go through self discovery. And then not yeah. only that, they have the thrill and the enjoyment of saying, I'm a published author. That was a really good answer, Shari. I really yeah, like the absolutely. way you express that. So since at Thought Row Podcast, we celebrate what people love to do creatively. And there's a lot of people in the world that like to write, even if they're just doing some journaling. What kind of satisfaction do you derive? And why do you think writing is so good for virtually everyone? I think in terms of writing, it's good for so many things. I think it's just a universal way of communicating. I also relate it to therapy Sometimes, I don't know, you can use it for many instances. If you're upset about something, you can just write it down and just move on, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. I think it's a way of just expressing yourself that you can do either privately or publicly, you know. Um, and there's various ways it, and there's various things that you can type, uh, write about and, and how you can utilize it once written. Um, and I just think that writing itself is just a very powerful form powerful medium um, in terms of communicating. And I think that anybody who has the skills to be able to write a book and, uh, <laughs> and then go the extra mile of having it uh, published, it's just really, a, it's a wondrous thing, honestly, it really is. I think there's a lot of anxiety also when people write a book and then they constantly think, wow, is this ever, is anybody ever going to read it? You know, I think everybody yes. kind of worries about that, mm -hmm. but in the reality, yeah. you shouldn't worry about that. You should just get the thing written and then yes. worry about publishing it later. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I think there is a bit of that. I mean, um, and I, and I also think that's where a lot of safe writing comes from within the industry. And that's, there tends to be, um, industry tends to be oversaturated with people that, <laughs> mimic other writers or everybody wants to be a JK Rowling rather than just be themselves, you know, and um, that's what's going to make the difference, you yeah, know, we, um, people in reading those stories. We call that follow the follower, following mm -hmm. the yes. follower and not following yeah. your own intuition. Who is the, exactly. our, uh, the artist, the writer who wrote the yearly? Mm -hmm. 
Oh gosh, now Sorry, you're blank. Yearly. <laughs> Yearly. And I love her she lives so in much. Florida. Yes. Or lived I in admire Florida. her so much. Oh she, gosh, Rod, I'm completely she blank. was she was always trying to write a, a more about Europe and history and things like that. And she was having a right. tough time. Nobody would pay attention to her books. Her publisher said, look, nobody wants to read this. And he said, why don't you read about your life in Florida? And she had this little yes. orange ranch and all kinds of interesting things happen. Okay, I remember now. Her name is Mar- Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Yes, right. Rawlings. And I love her yes. so much. Oh, yes. <laughs> but that makes a lot, you know, what you just said makes yes. a lot of sense. So Makes so much yeah. sense. You know, we need more writers that do write more for themselves rather than trying to be somebody that they're not. You know, we do need more authentic writing because it's that writing that's going to change things. You know, um, this safe writing, it doesn't it's not very impactful at all. Well, people are trying to, you know, just like artists, too. I mean, just a lot of people will create they see somebody else successful because they're painting roses so they start painting yes. roses and hope they can sell their roses and before you know it there's a whole bunch of doggone paintings of roses everywhere mm-hmm. yes. so they all of a sudden the, the shine on the rose has lost itself you know there's a lot to the process of publishing a book and probably the second part of that process is getting that book distributed so people yes. have the opportunity to read it. What are your thoughts on that, the distribution side yeah. of this? To be honest with you, I think that in terms of the distribution, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think probably more calls for it on the traditional side of uh, publishing. And even there are ways of doing the traditional publishing without the distribution side of things as well. But I think in terms of um, self-publishing, it's it's no different, probably just that the budgets are different. So it's really about the ownership is on the author in terms of or the depending on the arrangement that you have with the publisher um, to make sure that they are responsible and have an ownership, that they are responsible for the distribution side of things, you know, to get the book out there really is down to them. But there are a number of ways of, that you can do that. And if you look at the things, look at the money that's earned via KDP and, you know, the, the monthly earnings for that, right. the potential for that is far greater um, than you would find on any side of uh, traditional publishing. And um, the investment that's going into it, um, it, it far supersedes and outweighs traditional publishing by far these days. No, oh, that's interesting. And it's also, if you're the author, it's your book, you wrote it, you own it, and it's your responsibility to do whatever you can to market it. You need to exactly. go up there and sing, you know, sing your story and let people yep. know what you have written. And then a certain that's percentage right. of people are going to say, hey, I like what you wrote and I can't wait till you write another one. Exactly. I mean, um, you know, I wrote my first book in 2016 and, you know, people are still buying it today. You know, I mean, sometimes I kind of remember what was in the book, you know, it hasn't been <laughs> really since then, you know, and they, they kindly reminded me, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I suppose when you, after a while, they do just sort of, you know, you're always moving on, aren't you? Progressing and wanting to improve your writing. And I suppose that's why we do it so often. You know, I'm about to release my eighth this year and um you know i i think it's come a, uh, my writing has come a long way and has a lot more purpose than when i first wrote which is really important to me mm-hmm. well you know what you want to be a good writer write well also don't yes. you, you discover so much about yourself as you're doing yes. the writing process and developing your stories and you start to i think don't you think uh, that you there's a maturity if, that you acquire as you do the different books that you're doing? I think so. And I, and I, I think that um, there's definitely a maturity in terms of the learning process as well, you know, and how much your no book is ever the same. I mean, um, I've just released, well, well, we've just published um, one that will be coming out. That'll be the 69th (laughs) um, on, I think next Monday, uh, the 25th. And, you know, looking at the content, the layout, the cover, the work that's gone into that. I'm so proud of that particular publication. And that would be our most recent to date. And I suppose there's no bigger critic than the than me, myself, you know, sure. doing the work. Of and, course, um, yeah. you know, I'm so proud of this particular 
piece, especially, and I suppose even more prouder still that um, it was actually a publication for my business partner as well. <laughs> Makes me even prouder. Oh, but, that's um, great. Yes. Yeah, but, but looking at it, looking at the cover and everything, I'm so proud of everything. I mean, usually when we put something out, I know the, the technical problems that we've incurred with it and what could be slightly tweaked here or what I would improve and so on. But with this particular publication, we, we're just about to release. There's nothing I would change. We're happy with every single aspect of it. I mean, it's been hard to get it there because we do come up with different issues yeah. every time we publish, you know, especially when you're using um, someone else's platform to do that. You're only in control of so much. But um, we're so proud of it. I mean, that will be now the template for us and the standard going forward. Oh, yeah. like when you say that, I... I internally sigh for you because it's like when you when you get things to work in concert with one another and then at the end you're like yes I this is exactly how it's supposed to be without feeling like oh I should have done this I should have done that that is so congratulations on that oh thank you very much so Shara oh thank you I have a deeply uh, a deep personal question for you Um, you do okay (laughs) no the reality is is we all have insecurities and sometimes yes. it's hard to keep motivating ourselves to keep going and wake up every day and pursue what it is that we eat, breathe, sleep and think about. And sometimes yeah. the creative muse just doesn't seem to be anywhere around. In fact, I lost that <laughs> muse a few times. What do you do? What do you do when you're when you're just not feeling it's not it? Feeling it. It's not yeah. coming together for you. I just battle on through. Um, I take a break Mm -hmm. and um, I don't quit. I don't give up. I'm the most relentless person I know. And um, I can assure you, when I first started doing this, um, and uh, when I did the first book cover, for instance, with the first uh, collaboration for myself and uh, Andrew, you know, when we first started I balled up in a corner at one point and I just said, I just can't do this anymore. I don't think, you know, I've got it within me. We were, you know, putting up with so many technical problems. And when you're first starting out, the the equipment's quite poor, you know, (laughs) you're just, you know, you're just starting out and uh, yeah, you know, you're just hoping for the very best. And, you know, by then I'd run out of ideas. You know, the idea was that I didn't want to do this anymore, but you know, once you take a, a bit of a break and a bit of a step back um, mm-hmm. from the situation and really think things through. Um, you know, the ideas come and, you know, with a bit of prayer and faith and uh, belief, self-belief. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, um, you know, if, if other people who are probably not even qualified, which I am, <laughs> you know, something I uh, failed to mention, but, um, you know, if other people can do this, you know, there is there is no reason why, you can't. It's like driving, isn't it? You know, yeah. we eventually all learn how to. Mm-hmm. Um, some good as others, you know, some better than others. And, um, you know, we continue the course. But in terms of my own creativity, I am brimming with ideas. It doesn't stop. I wish they would sometimes, you know, give me a bit of a breather. Um, and I suppose that's why I work so hard because uh, there are so many ideas and so many things that come from offshoot from other things that I have done, you know, or we have done. And, you know, we're just so keen to maximize on those things. And, um, you know, if it's a good idea, we'll do it. Okay. And, um, you know, I want to, I want to get a couple more questions in here before we have to yeah. go. And my, I know for a fact that writers are usually prodigious readers. Yeah. What is what are your favorite books that you've read? And don't give me a oh, list dear. of sixty-seven books because we don't have time. <laughs> uh, one of my oh, that's a very very difficult question to answer. To be honest, I mean, there's a few. I would say there's one now that I absolutely love, and I would say if I could just say my favorite book at the moment, okay. I would yeah, say that's yeah, fine. that's good. Yeah, yeah, is the Ultimate Coach by Steve Hardison. I absolutely love the book, loved it so much. I highly recommend it. I recommend that everyone should read it um, and not just be, you know, taken aback by the, um, it's it's coaching for life, you know, for, for your personal life. And I would thoroughly recommend it. So, yeah, that would be my personal book of choice, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good I mean, one. It's a actually. motivational book. It helps you yes. in your business and your occupation. So yes. that's a very good uh in every choice. aspect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I like reading books like that myself more than yeah. than uh, novels. I like reading oh, things yes. that help my brain. Yeah, I know. That's you right. do. And yes. help me be more productive and, and 
do what we do better. I mean, we read stuff about podcasting. I agree. Well, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. Way, that way you get yeah. advice outside of your immediate zone, I guess. So that's kind of a yeah, good thing. I, I totally agree with you. I, I would be like that. And I think even with a good novel, it should have a good message as well. Yeah. Yeah, That's sure. So true. <laughs> so, and unfortunately, now we're getting to the point where we have to, we are going to ask you the question we ask all of our guests, which mm-hmm. is if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be, Shara? Oh, that's a, a big question as well. I think I tell you who I'd like to continue mm-hmm. a conversation with because it was only ever a fleeting and brief conversation that I had had. Um, this was back in 1994, 95, I believe. Oh, I and um, I briefly met with Nelson Mandela. Oh, wow. So if I was on a park bench. for you. Bench, yes. So if I was on a park bench, I would definitely would like to continue that conversation. You know, and it's funny, isn't it? I've chosen someone from that demographic as well, which I didn't even think about. You <laughs> know what? It's really, that's another interesting factor or thought. I mean, what I'd like to say is we had an artist on. <laughs> yes. Potenza. Potenza. Who, who, right. who met Nelson. Him, Nelson Mandela, Mandela. Who, was, who supported wow. her art. And uh, she did mention that. So, yeah, that's a good person to chat with. I Very think, good person. I think you could learn a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> How fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it would be an amazing experience. <laughs> okay, that's a good, great answer. Well, I hate to do Thank this, you. but, I know. Shara, uh, both Inge and I really enjoyed your unique perspective mm-hmm. on the Thank world you. of writing and publishing. Thank I think you our listeners much. are going to really pick up on your genuineness you're, you're a very genuine yeah. person and you were quick oh, to share you. some thoughts and ideas that other people can use and yes. so thank you for letting us in on your life's experiences yes thank oh, you you're Shara. Most welcome. And, oh you're most welcome oh, and thank you for and thank sharing. you so much for having me <laughs> oh we loved having you and and your thoughts on this and in a very inspiring and interesting story about um, your publishing company very unusual but gosh i, I think you're going to do so many great things with it Thank you. I hope so, too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But now it it comes the time when I need to let everyone know if you'd like to know more about Shara Lewis Campbell. We will have links for her under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com so everyone can learn more about her. And please connect with her on social media and check out her website. Yeah, it's it's definitely we're checking out what she's doing right now. You will find it fascinating. But thank you, Shara, for being with us. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye. Also, if you're enjoying our podcast, both Ron and I would really appreciate you buying us a cup of coffee. Just go to thoughtrow.com, scroll down a bit, and you can find that link right on our website on the homepage. It's really easy to do, by the way. Yes, it is. And all the money we receive goes to our production costs. Yep. And primarily because we want to keep our show commercial free and we want to continue to bring you the best quality content with great guests. That's right. Thank you for listening to Thought Row Podcast. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone 